Hey guys, welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew, and what I have for you is another installment of 10 Advanced Bushcraft and Survival Skills for Cold Weather or Winter Environment. It is still below freezing, so it's a great opportunity to demonstrate additional skills we can do out in the fields. Everything from cooking, to firecraft, to shelter, to a little bit of folk skills, as well as utilizing different resources. So make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment down below, and stand by. Now for our first skill, we need to get a fire going, and we have some down logs from some cottonwood trees that we're going to collect up and use for our first skill. Last few days, there's been some heavy winds, and they've knocked off a lot of dead branches. A couple of these are some large cottonwood branches that we sawed off or picked up off the forest floor that we're going to use for a long fire. Now we chopped off one of the ends just to make them a little bit more even. Another technique that we can do to help get our fire going is taking our axe and chopping into the tops of the log, exposing that dry wood underneath. Here we just collect up enough fire material, place it right on top to get ready to light our fire. One technique we can do to keep that top log supported off our fire lay long enough for us to get that fire started and allow oxygen to reach our fire is to create four stakes and then use that to actually lift up our top log. To ignite our long fire, we're gonna cut up our tinder, space it at even intervals in our fire lay underneath that top log, light them all at the same time so we get a nice even burn. The long fire is great for a cold weather environment because it generates a lot of heat, especially if those logs are as long as we are tall, we can lay down next to that fire and get a very even heat source and we can also cook over it at the same time. So this is a great fire to know and to use, especially with material that we can collect very easily. Sometimes tools break, and so we're going to demonstrate how to burn out and fix a broken axe handle. We have a cheap hatchet here, and we've sawed off the handle, demonstrating that it's broken. All we're going to do is take this axe handle, dig out our fire pit, and baton that axe, the bit, right into the dirt and pack it in. Then, from here, we're just going to gather fire that we've already created in the form of coals, sweep those over to our hatchet, build up the fire, and get a strong heat going so we can actually burn out that wood and plastic material that is in the eye of our hatchet. We have our axe handle already created and a wedge. Now we just need to saw in the kerf that's going to go into the top portion of our axe handle. We're going to pound that wedge in once it's fitted into the eye that we're currently burning out underneath our fire. Soil is going to protect the bit of our hatchet, and the fire is going to burn out the remainder of the wood handle inside the eye of the hatchet. Once we're ready, we sweep the coals away and check the eye of our hatchet. Once our hatchet is cooled down and we can handle it with our hands, we can now refit our new spare handle into the eye of our hatchet, batoning it down. We're then going to take the wedge and apply the wedge, pounding it into place until that axe handle is firm in the eye of the hatchet and then now all we have to do is saw off the remainder of the wedge shape up the top of that hatchet handle and it's ready for use this is a great technique to know because the axe or the hatchet is going to be our primary tool in cold weather environments typically and sometimes tools break and so knowing how to refit a hatchet handle or an axe handle is an incredibly valuable skill in a winter environment now let's talk a little bit of shelter craft. There's a very simple, easy technique to allow us to gather a large amount of debris in a very short time frame to build a grass debris survival shelter. Observe the grass laying down in the open prairie. Grab that grass, pull it the opposite direction it is laying, and you'll begin to peel back the grass. Roll it as you peel, and you can collect a large amount of debris in a very short time to apply to your survival shelter to stay warm. And take that grass back to our shelter site, we're going to leave one roll out as a blanket. We collected up about four or five armfuls of prairie grass using this technique in a very short time, about 10 minutes or so. And we're going to create a very viable survival shelter for the coldest of environments, this grass nest debris shelter or a Bigfoot bed. What we're going to do is just lay down that grass. We're going to keep one roll out to act as our blanket. We're going to use our hands and our feet to form that pile of grass into a nest, giving us four inches of compressed debris on the forest floor and then even walls surrounding us 360 degrees to keep us warm. We're going to get in our shelter 
pull our hood up and then grab that grass that's going to act as our blanket that we place at the foot of the shelter. Roll it on top of us to complete our shelter, acting as a blanket to keep us warm. And when we're done, we just roll it off, get up, shake off the grass, and we're good to go. This next skill is going to be a bush pot steamer. Typically, I recommend we carry two bush pots, one large bush pot and one small bush pot. We have a one quart and we have a three quart. Both have fry pan lids that we can use, as well as strong bales to suspend these bush pots over the fire. Plus, that small bush pot can fit inside the other bush pot for packing, and this makes a very convenient and nice kit to carry in the woods. Our bush pot steamer, we're going to take the lid of the smaller bush pot, put it face down inside the larger bush pot, take the small bush pot, put it on top of that lid, and then cover everything with a large bush pot lid. Very simple technique and easy to use, especially with limited water in a cold environment. What we do is just put whatever we're going to cook in the small bush pot, in this case rice. We're going to add a little bit of warm water because it's rice, and then we're going to take the rest of the water and pour it down inside the large bush pot to collect at the bottom, and then we're going to place everything over the fire. What's going to happen is the water in the bottom of that bush pot is going to boil, the steam will form at the top and begin to steam and cook the rice as we leave it over the fire. We can add more water if we need to get more steam, but it will cook nice and easy this way. Now we're going to check the rice occasionally, stirring it to make sure that it's actually cooking. One thing we want to be aware of is that with that boiling water, the water is actually going to pool and get pushed up inside the lid of that small bush pot. So we may need to adjust occasionally, but we can see that the rice is cooking nicely and should be done here in the next few minutes. I really like this technique. I picked this up from a Japanese survivalist that would use this technique with one bush pot and pieces of bamboo lined in the bottom with water to steam organs or other meats from kills off the landscape. But today we're going to eat rice, so we just pull it off when it's ready, stir it up. We can even recover that with a lid to let the steam continue to make that rice soft. But now we have our meal ready to go with a bush pot steamer. Cooking any type of food that we bring out with us camping in a winter environment or that we collect off the landscape or harvest off the landscape in the form of wild game, we need to learn how to cook and maximize calorie intake to get all the calories we need because our body is going to be working overtime in a cold weather environment. One of the ways we can maximize calories in a cold weather environment cooking our food is with aluminum foil or some sort of wrapping we can place over the fire to keep everything together and collect all of the juices and calories that we need. We're going to cut up a potato, we're going to cut up an onion as well as some carrots and then we have seasonings as well as oil and butter that we're going to put inside of the aluminum foil for our hobo meal. Aluminum foil provides us the opportunity to keep every ingredient and every morsel of food inside that aluminum foil for maximum calorie intake. We're going to eat everything that's inside this meal to maximize those calories. Believe it or not, but this is a deer heart, and deer heart is one of my favorite meals. I actually scavenged this deer heart from a neighbor's deer kill that they left the guts out and it froze overnight. Still good to go, bright red, excellent food. We're just gonna chop this up and throw it in with our hobo meal right on top of our vegetables. Once we add the meat, we're just gonna put a little bit more seasoning over the top. We did have oil, garlic, and butter that we put on top of the vegetables sitting underneath that meat to give it a lot of good flavor and extra calories in the form of fats. Now that our meal is prepped and wrapped up, we can go clean our hands and then clean our tools that have touched this raw meat. Using ash from the fire, we can scrub our knife and our hands and wash off in the creek to help clean ourselves off. Now this hobo meal inside our aluminum foil from our survival kit is a meal that needs to cook very low and slow. So we need to get a fire going, build up that fire ember base, and then let it cool down to where we have just nice embers collected in our fire pit. From here we can then add our hobo meal right on top of those embers. We don't need to flip it or turn it very often and let it cook low and slow so we don't burn the food inside the aluminum foil. With the oil and fats from the butter that we put inside this meal, that's going to help cook the meat that's on top of our vegetables. We're going to create a pair of chopsticks and then open up our hobo meal and begin to enjoy this feast. This is an excellent meal, one of my favorites in the field to make, get a lot of calories, a lot of nutrients, and thrive in survival.
This next scale, we're going to need just a small section of log, relatively straight, that we can baton out the center. We are going to baton this log into quarters and then make stop cuts about an inch from the bottom of the log and baton out the center to form what will become a candle mold. We had that deer heart for lunch. We also kept a lot of the guts and the tallow and fat from the guts, and we're going to turn that tallow and fat from those deer guts into a tallow candle for survival. Our log is hollowed out, and now we're just going to get some cordage and actually wrap around this log to keep it together to act as a secure mold. With our mold complete, we're just going to use bank line to secure everything, use a jam knot at the bottom to keep everything together tight, and then wrap tight with that cordage evenly about halfway up the mold to help protect everything and keep the tallow from coming out as much as possible once we melt it. But with that complete, we'll just use a clove hitch over top, cut it, tie securing knot, and now our mold's ready to go. Another good skill is to be able to pick up a Swedish torch from the bottom, throw it in your fire pit to enhance the already burning fire in that pit. But we have a good fire now, and we can take the lid off of our large bush pot to act as a fry pan. That way we can actually melt or render down this tallow, put it in the fry pan, put it over the fire, and let it begin to melt until it turns into a liquid. Our deer tallow is going to melt, and we're going to get that nice liquid. Once we have enough of that liquid collected, we pull it off, let it cool for a little bit, and then pour it into our mold. A little bit is going to escape through the cracks. That's okay. That will solidify. We just continue this process and repeat until our mold is full. We have quite a bit of tallow, and we salvaged a lot from the guts of that deer kill. And so we're going to use this to make one big candle and then fill up a small jar with extra tallow that we can use for future tasks later on. We placed a piece of jute twine inside the mold to act as a wick. We want to let the candle solidify for as long as possible. This one has sat out overnight at freezing temperatures, so it's pretty solid. Now we can take our lighter light our wick that jute twine it will begin to burn because it's soaked with that tallow and we have our candle candle will light we've got that but the final test is to remove the bank line and then break open the mold to see how our candle has held up in that mold to see if it's one large candle or if it's broken apart we can undo that cordage and then simply break off one side of the mold at a time and we'll find that we have one giant deer tallow candle that is still good to go. We can take this, set it out, and actually light it. And the best part about deer tallow candles or any tallow candle is that it is edible in a survival situation. So not only do we have light, but we also have food in an emergency, especially out here in the cold. All right, this next task is a super easy one. Great for cold weather environments and making it through a cold night by staying warm and applying a little bit more heat to our body, especially in a select place using hot water. So we're going to need our bottle and cup set and heat up some water in our cup on the fire. We have cold water in our bottle, and then we have boiling hot water in our cup on the fire. We're going to grab that water off the fire while it's hot and dump it right back into our water bottle, heating that water up to a hot temperature to keep us warm. We're going to utilize our body's natural functions of blood flow to transfer heat up and down our bodies by placing that water bottle heater in between our legs next to our femoral arteries to get that heat transferred. We've got our blanket, our water bottle heater, and one extra set of items that we can use to improve our shelter and stay warm again through the night. It's a very simple trick, but something that I highly recommend and that I've used for a lot of training and out in cold environments, and that's carrying an extra pair of extra thick wool socks. What we do is remove our dirty, nasty, sweaty socks, and then let our feet dry next to the fire, and then put on our thick wool socks while we sleep during the night. With that water bottle heater in those extra thick wool socks that I've had for years, use this technique to stay warm, especially with minimal shelter materials. It makes for a much more comfortable night and a pleasant sleep, especially in a cold environment. All right, so some free chicken for you. We just put on those heavy wool socks that are dry and warm. We're trying to reduce or prevent cold weather injuries to our digits. A thing we can do, a technique or method, with those dirty, nasty socks we just took off, if we don't have a fire and we have to dry these socks out somehow, some way, we can use our own body heat. What we do is take these socks, tie them together in a non-slip knot up at the top of the sock so we have the feet material exposed. And what we can do is use our own body heat to actually dry out these socks. I've used this in a lot of mountain training and cold weather training, and it seems to work fairly well. So we just take this now, 
put it over and around our neck, tuck the socks into our first layer of clothing, not directly against our body, but our first layer of clothing. And if we're moving around, even while we're sleeping, our body heat is going to begin to dry out these socks. So we have at least a dry pair in the morning to put on if we switch out those socks. Or if we're out working, doing light work, we can continue to use our body heat to dry off our clothing and help reduce and prevent cold weather injuries. The more you know. So this is a bonus skill. Didn't really intend on demonstrating the skill of breaking down larger material using a one stick fire method to process that dry material that's protected within the wood itself and use that to actually get a fire going in a cold environment. But we needed to get another fire going for additional skills. This video was actually filmed over several days while compiling a lot of these skills running a trap line, hunting, doing a lot of things around the farm, taking care of business. And so we need another fire going, so why not include this in the video? It's very simple. We use our ax, our saw, and our knife to baton and process material down into smaller and smaller sections, increasing that surface area, meaning that ignition sources will ignite that fine material that has increased surface area, giving us that fire, building it up very quickly so we can move along and get our next task done. And that next skill we're going to demonstrate is one that is near and dear to my heart because it's one of the best meals to have in a survival situation and one of the best I've had in survival training is a simple meat broth stew. Using fresh game off the landscape that we've hunted or caught or snared, we process that meat, put it in a bush pot with water, and bring it to a boil, cooking the meat but then saving all the nutrients along with that meat. When we do this, we want to place that bush pot over the fire and let it cook until that water is reduced by half, giving us a good concentrated broth. This simple stew method is great for, again, maximizing caloric intake in a cold weather environment. Because our bodies are going to be working so hard, we need to maximize all the food we have. Making a simple stew like this and reducing it down means we have a good thick broth, we have water that we can hydrate with, as well as the meat is now cooked and safe to consume. So we have all of this meal all together maximizing calories. So once again, we have hydration in the form of that water in that broth that we can now consume. We probably could have saved a little bit of salt from our hobo meal earlier and thrown it in here to get a little bit more sodium. But we have that meat cooked as well so we can pull that out, eat the meat off the bone, and continue boiling those bones for another broth. And don't forget the organs. Add organs to the stew to cook them and get those vitamins and minerals that we need. Then for that next skill, one we demonstrated in a previous video, but still important for a cold weather environment because the resources are still there, even in a cold environment, is making just a simple, withy pot hanger using a tripod and then a green sapling harvested off the landscape. This is a great technique because it requires no cordage. Therefore, we don't have to actually use our cordage. We can maintain that cordage for other tasks while we're out in the field, other survival tasks. So we maximize cordage management and just use natural materials thinking outside the box. With this withy, all we're going to do is harvest a green sapling and then begin twisting down the shaft of that sapling to expose the fibers, build that flexibility so we can actually tie this withy around a tripod. We just harvested some tripod material off the landscape, three poles, doesn't matter. We just tie them together with that withy and then we can now suspend our bush pot over a fire. We can elevate or lower that tripod simply extending the legs out or moving those legs or bringing them closer together over the fire to boil our water, cook our food, make medicines in our bush pot, whatever we need to. And then when we're done, this material will go back to nature because it's biodegradable. Very simple, minimalist approach to camp craft and basic skills that we can employ in survival as well as bushcraft. All right, guys. So that was 10 plus 1 bushcraft and survival skills for a cold weather environment. I really hope you liked this video. If you did like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment in the comment section. I always appreciate your feedback. I want to thank you guys for thinking you do for me, for this channel, for your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.